No, I don't want but to. But we can talk about the fluidity of, of the timing of your departure from this call. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can, uh, we can talk about the fluidity of the definition of engineering. So before we get too deep into this, can you tell me, are you guys going to tell me what you talked about last week in my, in my absence? Yeah, but we're streaming live on YouTube right now. Hi, everybody. Hello, world. It's uh, Door 3 TV, Open Hours, Episode 4-ish. Uh, and we're here live. Jonathan Blessing, CEO of Door 3, Alex Asanov, President uh, of Door 3, and Founder, Liz Flintz. He, he, he did found, he did, you founded <laughs> Door 3. You don't say, you didn't find it. You founded it. I, I didn't find it. It was not on the side of the road I was driving by, but, um, you know. Here we are. I, I know um, we have something we're going to discuss, but what did, what did you guys uh, cover last week? We talked about um, RFPs and how to make RFPs mm. that don't make us confused and sad. Mm. Um, and mm. the sort of besides our uh, sort of feelings about RFPs, the ways in which RFPs can fail to serve their clients, the clients who produce said mm. RFPs. Scintillating. Yeah. It was, a, it was a project. It was, this was like a, uh, something that was heavy on my mind at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think okay. scintillating it's is what my background is doing. Oh. It's scintillating. Um. Okay, so, and, and today, Liz, the topic of conversation? So I'm going to introduce myself because I was interrupted before. I'm Liz Flintz. I'm the director of UX and design at Door 3. I'm here in space. Uh, Jonathan is in his office in New Haven. And Alex seems to be in some northern lights situation. Hiding out from my Florida heat. Yeah. Nice. In the north of Norway. Uh, Bergen, maybe. Um, okay, so today we, what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about how engineers think about UX and design. Um, this is one of those topics that's like, you know, one of my friends really think of me that's maybe dangerous for designers to start asking about. Um, but I, I'm, I'm just curious. I, I want to know. And I think it's also helpful for us as designers to um, sort of figure out how engineers approach UX and design, um, how it's conceived of on the other side of the fence. I don't see a fence. Yeah, no. so this is interesting because I conceived of this as like a, some kind of divide. Um, and then we started talking about how people do more design in their lives than they do engineering. Like maybe everybody's a designer, but not everybody's an engineer. And Jonathan, you brought up the example of people organizing their underwear drawer mm -hmm. and that that was a function of engineering. But to me, that's a function of design or at least information architecture maybe. So I'm curious so it turns out that actually the issue here is that we have different definitions of what design is and what engineering is. Well, I actually think it's an indication of the fact that, uh, uh, you know, you're both right in a certain sense. Jonathan is right in that the divide is not as, as cut and dry. Like uh, that, that, that process of organizing your sock drawer is a process of both design and engineering and engineering is a form of design. You know, right? had, had so, I known, had I known that this is where we would begin, I would have started, I would have started this call, our meeting up in my bedroom. So you could show us said I would, sock I want and or underwear sock drawer. drawer? Yeah, yeah. I, I want Can we do the sock drawer, not the underwear drawer? <laughs> like I... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, Alex, I think sadly you and I are going to agree. I, I just, um, because it's, it's much more interesting when we fight. But yeah, I, I, I see this really just as, um, I don't see a strict divide. I see it really as a, a difference of emphasis and perspective. But this is, a, it's all along a continuum. Like I, you know, I, and I actually suggested the sock drawer, Liz, in order to be provocative because um, it, 
the easier argument to make is that really what I'm doing is I'm like UX engineering my sock drawer. You know, I'm, I'm putting the, the socks that I more frequently grab nearer at hand and then dress socks, which I, I don't even I'm like the category of dress socks. Let's assume, let's just accept its existence and move on. So accepting its existence, it's in the back. Mm -hmm. It's in the back where I don't see them. But I, I think, you know, to simply say that they're the same, uh, it, like this is a little bit like, you know, mathematicians and, and, and long distance runners. There, there are going to be long distance runners who can do math, right? And there are going to be mathematicians who can do some running, but they're not the same kind of people, right? Oh, uh, I don't know. And, I don't know. I happen to be. I, I'm married to one. <laughs> I am oversimplifying dramatically, right? But but let's just let's just it's go a with me here. Example. I mean, let, let's not a let's terrible... talk about. <laughs> Sometimes, for sake of illustration, you don't want to bring yeah. the entire world in and say, "Let's factor a hundred different dimensions of complexity and how they overlap or don't." It's just just I understand that there are some probably very talented runner mathematicians, but those exceptions aside, right? There are, there are people who run practically professionally, right? They're, sh they're shooting for the Olympics. They're doing all this other stuff and they're probably not going for the Fields Medal at the same time, right? And, and there are people who, you know, can run for the bus, but, but their, their main job is going for the Fields Medal. And I, and I think that uh, the UX and, uh, and engineering are a little bit like that. Yes, there is an overlap and there, there are certain aspects that can be done by, by both kinds of people, but the specialization is highly valuable in many, if not most circumstances. Well, <laughs> uh, of course. I mean, how can how can I how can I disagree with that? Of course. I mean, aside from the oh, you can find a good, way. You can. Find I a can way. find a way. <laughs> <laughs> it's me we're talking about. Well, I think something that uh, Jonathan said to me a long time ago was that um, mm, you this, know this engin engineers yeah. have to have to uh, think about the edge cases um, are developing for edge cases and designers are. Um, engineering developing... for common cases yes the most common yeah. cases and i think and i think that's that is that uh, to me that that does strike at an essential truth that does differentiate the focus of an engineer from the focus of a ux designer ux designers should be concentrating on ensuring that the common uses are smooth and obvious right like the um the, the way in which a doorknob works, for instance, it's, I mean, we all know how to operate a doorknob. It's only when we try to use the lock <laughs> that, that we might get a little confused if we're not familiar with it. Um, whereas engineers, they, they really need to concern themselves with what happens to the bridge that I'm designing if 10 times as many semi-trucks all loaded with flour drive over it at once. Mm -hmm. 10 times like the average just show up, will it survive? Um, and that's really where engineers need to occupy themselves, the edges where, where things break. That's fair. Okay. That's oh, fair. Gosh. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we you, all you agree with you. Uh, you I, I agree with you in most cases, right? There, there are edge cases that... Um, Said like, spoken like an engineer. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, the, there are edge cases that we can explore where UX design is, is really, really key. Right? And there are edge cases in application behavior um, that happens to be quite complex. So if you if you deal with interactions that are complex, they, they happen when they happen. They're they're very important, right? But they happen infrequently. You know, um, it, I, I'm going to try to bake an analogy out of your the flour on those trucks, right? So uh, so if you have uh, all these trucks going over a bridge, 10 times the, 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 the weight for which the, the bridge was certificated, right? Um, and there is a structural fa failure. What are the ways and avenues by which rescue workers can get there? But what are the best ways to actually handle that? What, what's the human side of, of that, uh, that unfortunate event going to be like, right? Uh, and I think... Uh, by analogy, is someone who concerns themselves with the human side of the equation more than with the machine side of the equation is going to be slightly better equipped to think that through. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, think there's we, also, oh, sorry, go ahead, Jonathan. No, I, I was just going to say that this isn't, we're not actually answering the, the, the question you asked at the start of this, Liz, which is how do engineers think about UX? Was that it? 
Yeah. How do, they how do you, how do engineers think about UX? It's the, what do my friends really think about me question? Um, I, I can, I, I can, no, I can, I can list the, like, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to find delicate ways to put this. <laughs> so <laughs> it's because there's a range of, of funny and serious answers to this question. And even the funny ones have some, some degree of reality to them. Right. So, so, um, UX designers are, uh, you know, the stereotype is like they're they're a little bit on the sensitive side. You know, you 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 kind of want to uh, steer clear of their sensitivities, and then you want to give them some room to do what they do. Engineers are never sensitive. That's what I yeah. think about engineers. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's no, right. I mean, really, that's right. Now this this is ridiculous. This is <laughs> of course. Well, yes, and the, the, this so, is the, speaking but yourself, the, the so ridiculous when you, part. When you were a software developer. Uh huh. How did you regard the role of UX on your projects? I, I thought that it was uh, something that I wanted to participate in. It, it was something that I, I respected the discipline uh, and the capabilities of the people, the, the differences between myself and UX designers mm -hmm. and the emphasis. And I really wanted to get their input, right? So interesting, I came up, I think, at a time when you, you were also coming up. Mm -hmm. And we, in, you know, in the projects that I was on, UX was often not present. Oh, same mm -hmm. here, same here. Yeah. I just, when UX became present in my professional life, I made the pivot I very, it, I very quickly. Worth, I think it's worth noting uh, for posterity, you know, for the millions that are watching our discussion, um, that in the 90s and in, in aughts, there was no UX. When it, did it when us. would you say it became part of the well, discourse? You know, so for the most part, I my the first ten years of my career as a software developer were largely spent building systems for large corporations, and they were going to be used by the by the employees. Mm -hmm. So you know we're, we you know we did a lot of work for um, in, in the record industry, for instance, you know, the recording industry which we used to call the record industry, but now we just call it the recording industry. <laughs> and all the systems that we built and overhauled were, were largely for small communities of in-house users. Mm -hmm. there, there was just simply- Did you work with information architects? So that term of art back in the day was synonymous for um, database architect. Huh. So, so that's actually, I have a different take on it because uh, I remember hiring a U uh, an information architect in 2003, mm -hmm. right? And already doing information architecture in the first days of Door 3's existence in 2002. So mm -hmm. when I was at Sapient in, in the late 90s, we had UX designers and, uh, and visual designers already. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were called that, right? They were also called information architects, right? So... Um, so uh, one person uh, held all those titles at the same time, or it, it depends on who was speaking. It was the same person that they so were refer we, referring to. We hmm. at, at the firm I was at, we had a team of graphic designers, mm -hmm. and the graphic designers were respond. So they would only really be deployed. They might they might be they might have a small tactical role to play on the development of screens, mm -hmm. but they never had global ownership. That really fell to the consultants. I, I, I will tell you, like, uh, yeah. you know, what you just described was a situation at companies like Razorfish, which was like, there, there were two families of companies that, that were growing in the late 90s. There were the companies that came out of a technology tradition, which like Sapient and Scient. And then you had companies that came out of the agency background, like Razorfish, right? And in companies like Razorfish, you heard of graphic designers, right? And, uh, and they focused more on that kind of stuff. And, and the information architecture component was something that they were learning to do, right? And on the other side were the engineering driven companies that were focused on uh, you know, information architecture first and foremost, which was not database architecture. There was a distinction, all right? Information, uh, information architecture was about the, in, the architecture of the information presentation. I might then argue that Sapient was ahead of the curve because where, where, where I was, and not just where I was just in the late 90s, early aughts, but even where I went afterwards, information architects, initially the term I only saw deployed as a synonym for database architect. Then it evolved into being the owner of the data dictionary mm -hmm. for uh, an information system. So you mm -hmm. might not have a hand in designing any of the persistent storage systems 
or even the OO architecture of the application layer, but you would be the person who owned the data dictionary. The, mm -hmm. the metamorphosis of the word into how we use the expression into how we use it today, um, I didn't see that complete until say 2010. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I remember in 2000, I wanna say in, two, uh, in 1998 or 1999, Sapient acquired eLabs which was uh, like the, one of the earliest, earliest ethnographic analysis companies uh, mm -hmm. working in the service of information architecture and, 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 and software de development, right? Uh, it was already, a, and that was like a big you know, user research uh, element to inform the information architecture, right? So uh, yeah, way ahead of its time. And th there was a lot of market mm -hmm. uh, noise about that and a lot of success that Sapien mm -hmm. had in sales as a result. But you know something you also said, Alex. I, I I I I would echo. You know, in the early days, when when I did come to appreciate the role and the skill set that was possessed by UX folks, I I was really curious, right? I really I wanted to be there while it was happening, mm -hmm. and I immediately saw that this was just a continuation of the work that the engineers were doing. I did not mm -hmm. see it as a um, as like a bright line or a fence that the world yeah. would be thrown over. I think there's something to be said for like that metaphor of the, um, you know, the edge case, like the engineers are finding, it's not a metaphor, but like defining engineering as mm -hmm. working towards the resolving the edge cases and design as resolving the, the main use cases yeah, the of common case the common case, like what, what, like the, you know, really trying to ensure success for the stated reason the software is being developed. But I think that part of what UX does is determining which are edge cases, because a lot, so much of what UX has turned into, and we see this mm -hmm. more and more as I've like recently talked to all these young grads who are applying for these uh, junior UX or roles, many of them the focus in the programs that they're in, which also like, by the way, there were no programs obviously, uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And now there's this proliferation of these like UX uh, design programs, but the focus of their programs is a lot on research. It's like ethnographic sociological research and research methodologies. Um, the point of which is to figure out what are edge cases and what are common mm -hmm. cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there, there's, you know, as I'm imagining different scenarios and remembering different scenarios I've lived through, I really, I'm challenged to think of these things as simply on a continuum uh, and, uh, you know, developers will, in certain cases, uh, do just as good a job, let's say, as a designer. Like, like the, the emphasis and thinking of, of an engineer is on getting stuff done. The, it's efficiency in terms of time, getting things done quickly because they're always on the timeline. It's efficiency of implementation so that it, it's maintainable, scalable, like all this other stuff, right? Uh, it's minimizing the amount of code that they have to write to get something done, right? And those things don't, uh, those priorities often are in direct uh, unmitigated conflict with, with the user priority. So for example, if you want to create a screen that has good spacing for information so people can consume the information easily. The best solution is not to slam a grid onto, onto a screen and say, here's all your data, right? Uh, and force people to scroll vertically and horizontally to find the things that aren't, that aren't fitting on the screen, right? But that is the fastest, most expedient way to slam a bunch of data onto a screen from an engineer's perspective, right? So, uh, so, so there is, if you, if you have the, the UX designers, do the straight and narrow, the happy path on an application, and then say, hey, engineers, good luck with that, finish, finish up, we, we gave you guidance, right? Without proper training in maintaining uh, kind of stylistic and, direct and UX directional discipline, engineers will say, thank you very much, these screens are great, and then proceed to slam a bunch of grids onto a bunch of auxiliary screens, right? Uh, and so, uh, because that, that meets their priorities, right? And so, the, the ability to think from the user side and remember what engineers are doing all day long. They are heads down, letter by letter, clicking out code. There is, it, it is difficult to imagine that in all cases for all engineers, right? All, even 
even all good engineers are going to be able to do that, do that well. Think about the architectural and, and, the, and the code level co considerations while keeping all of the user considerations and style considerations in mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, given the difference in priorities and workload direction, right, emphasis, uh, the, the UX designers are also really important for keeping things aligned. Like one, one of the most basic metrics of like good user experience design is consistency. Like if an application is simply inconsistent, you could have great well-designed screens on two different sides of it. And it's not a usable application because when you go left to right, you're, 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 you have Alex, to relearn you, it. You, you may remember right. this, mm -hmm. but there before, uh, before Apple, there was a company called BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. And in 2007, they had, um, they had, I think they were called PDAs, I think, mm -hmm. personal digital assistants. We would call them yep. smartphones now. Uh, so theirs was the best in mm -hmm. the world. And Apple uh, showed up with something called an iPhone. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think that's what it was called in 2007. And it was terrible. I mean, by, by all standards, it was terrible. It was slow. It didn't work well. Uh, and it didn't do nearly as much as the BlackBerry. I don't think you can buy a BlackBerry anymore. And I, 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 I know the company still exists, but I don't know that they make product anymore. And what I would say is that BlackBerry lost to Apple on the strength of UX. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I think that's, that was really what Apple did that BlackBerry did not do. I think they, the BlackBerry device really felt like it was created by engineers for engineers. Mm -hmm. I like well, it. Uh, or other people. I mean, I think engineers and also like executives, you know, people who are like trying it, to do it, kind it of a lot a, of things at once. It maybe. was a device that rewarded mastery. It was a right. terrible first date, right? The iPhone, even though it didn't do much, it was a great first date. It was so easy to learn it. Very, very like, Whereas the BlackBerry had a pretty steep learning curve, mm -hmm. and it went very deep into uh, into shortcuts and screens and um, other other kind of automations, but it really rewarded that investment. But Apple correctly saw that you know most people didn't want to make that investment, and that there was a much larger market out there, right? For 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 all of us, if if they could, um, yeah, if they could reach it, which they BlackBerry yeah. designed for the edge case. They really did. Yeah, that was my point. Thank you. <laughs> Blackberry, Blackberry was a device that was really designed for, like it was, des it, it, was it, it really showed kind of engineering thinking. Mm -hmm. it did everything up to the borders well. Yeah, that's true. Who still owns a Blackberry? Um, my mother called me during the early days of the pandemic. She was in tears. She was, in, and I knew what it was going to be about. Her BlackBerry had died. And she I thought, wasn't the that, whole thing with Hillary Clinton that she still used a BlackBerry too. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but I can tell you that my mother did up until a few months ago when she, 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 my, my father with, with a great deal of patience, love and kindness brought her to the Apple store and supported her through the transition. And she now has an iPhone. Oh, wow. It's touch and go, but. Was, yeah. Was there, a, was there a ceremony? No, but we don't talk about it. All right. Look, I, I mean, I think that um, getting back to the question of what engineers think about UX, right? Um, I, I think that, um, by and large, uh, th th there is another dimension to this, which is, you know, engineers uh, may, old, older generation engineers may think of it as unnecessary. I've come across, you know, even CIOs who sort of weren't brought up with this dimension of value as, a, as, as an important element of what they were resp responsible for, who still don't sort of feel like it's that important, especially for in-house in applications because they, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it is important. And one of the things that happens when engineers come to like working with UX designers and the UX design product, um, the output of that is that they also can become overly dependent on it. And the, the, I've seen that happen as well. So, 
you know, if the application does not have highly complex edge case scenarios and they're not provided uh, therefore by a UX designer, sometimes engineers are, are, who are used to getting almost everything spoon fed to them from, from, from the UX side are like, uh, wh where are the wireframes? Where is it, where's the design comp for this, this screen? And, and the answer is, well, you've got plenty of guidance here. You've got the style guide, you've got your keystone pages, you've got most of the components that, that you would need extrapolate just a little bit don't you, you know you, you're not handcuffed right and so there's a um, uh, you know if you train engineers to value ux as a as a pattern that's given to them but not as a uh, not as a set of handcuffs or a straitjacket doesn't where you're not allowed to touch code unless you have you know commensurate you know or related uh, ux design for that screen i think that's a that's that's the, the right balance and monitoring the, the thinking in, in the engineering team and making finding that balance, I think is really important because it can sway one way or the other too easily. You know, I, I, I would, um, so yesterday I did something novel. I used a Windows computer, which I, I've not really done much in the last 15 years. And, and I think I mentioned this to you, Alex, uh, uh, earlier. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm impressed by how little change has occurred in the UI. It's basically the same as it was back in 1995, 1996. Mm -hmm. But where, where I would love to see the influence of UX or some holistic thinking. So something I was shocked to discover, Windows still has, so you go, you'll, you'll go into a settings menu. <laughs> and then there'll be a, another menu, like advanced settings. <laughs> and then you'll go into the advanced settings and then there'll be another one, like more advanced settings. <laughs> and there's yeah. very little discipline brought. And this is, and I, I guess I was just, I was surprised to see th that in, you know, in 2021, it's still the case that the Windows operating system is still, I would say, dominated by engineers in terms of its, its UI. There's very, I, there doesn't seem to have been much kind of disciplined thought brought to the layout of menus, something as fundamental as menus. Yeah, I think that the divide has become more extreme because everyone who works in anything that mm -hmm. is at all design oriented or creative has almost complete allegiance to Apple products for better or worse. And I would say too, and then in the software world, no one uses Windows anymore. It's, it's, I don't know, personally, even, even my engineering friends who, who are .NET folks, they use Linux. Huh. I mean, I know, I know that we've got a few here at door three that still use Windows because they, they like the IDEs, uh, the visual, visual, uh, Visual Studio in particular, but I think that even runs now in Linux. Hmm. I, I think that uh, one of the challenges, right, is is that when you have a deep, um, and and in the case of Windows, fairly old uh, code base, which has been upgraded a lot. I'm not not taking anything away from Microsoft. They have thousands of engineers that that, oh, that are spending it, a lot of time on it. Back in 2000, when they transitioned to the NT kernel, that was a huge migration. And yeah, that really huge. brought a lot of good to the world as well in terms for security, stability. Um, but but in order to uh, bring that same level of revolution to the user experience design, you have to have number one, even separate from having a lot of designers, you have to have the willingness to kind of turn your your ex user experience upside down a little bit. And one of the things I've heard from uh, C-level executives, uh, chief operating officers, CEOs, sometimes CIOs, is that they, they, they worry that even good change is still change, right? Mm -hmm. and, so, and so you have to push change onto your user community. And so even if they're used to this, uh, you know, uh, so, somewhat crazy three levels, four levels of more and more deeper, deeper settings, right, in Windows, if you change it, then, and I've seen this by the way, also like uh, you'll have a, a small uh, sub community that's gonna be like, well, where, where'd that go? Like I, I, that's, where, that's where I'm used to going and I'm an administrator. I don't have time to deal with all these, these new newfangled things, right? And you have to kind of be willing to look at your audience and say, you know, we're willing to, to serve a new audience better 
even if we lose 5% of, 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 the, of the laggards, right, along the way, or they'll come along anyway, they'll just c- come along kicking and screaming, and they'll be fine three months later, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, so some of that, like the willingness to create change because change is good, and not uh, to say change is bad because change is, change is work. Right, uh, it's essential. You can't you can't do the kind of revolution you're talking about to Windows, you know, administration screens without that willingness. And then on top of that, you have to leverage enough UX designers to keep up with the the, the number of engineers that you have working on the product. Sounds very reasonable you to know, me. I think yeah, there's a there's a deeper point I think in what you're saying. Um, really? Where? I... Yeah. No. I, well. No. <laughs> because I, I think I think you're actually you're 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 encircling an import like an important challenge that UX may encounter that engineering doesn't encounter, which is the you know the type of change the the or rather the um, the playing field of change on which UX works directly affects a great more people more more of the time right if engineers are doing their job and doing it well it's almost like their their changes are almost unseen right their 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 improvements are almost unseen right things work better they might work faster they might be more secure uh, they they uh, support growth but when ux be- begins to kind of i i guess you know uh, power the revolution, right? People notice. Everyone notices. Yeah, and, it's interesting. Uh, there's this there's this truism about design. I don't remember who coined this phrase that great design is invisible. Um, mm-hmm. But maybe that's more true of engineering than it is of design. I mean, y- you don't notice at all when the bridge doesn't fall down, um, and Actually, and you shouldn't I've heard notice it said at all. That great great design is obvious. Like it's obviously great. You know, you can think about some iconic objects of the 20th century. I, I think I so first of all, I, I think what you said, Liz, is very insightful with regard to engineering. Uh, great engineering is often, not always, but often invisible. Mm-hmm. But I do agree. I, I also think that uh, good UX. It's not that it's uh, invisible. I think that's that's a mistake. But uh, there's uh, the, the engineering part of good UX is invisible. It's the, the, the part yeah, the of it where you're, point... you're, you're the part of it where uh, it's easier to use and you don't have to have a handbook to learn it. it that's not obvious why that's so. Think about, right. think about the, how you, were, you were being a Windows apologist a few minutes ago. And, and I think therein you, you have... <laughs> <laughs> was I? Was I really? Yeah. An apologist. Hey, Hello. <laughs> She's a walk-on. It's, nice it's nice to have guests. Yeah. <laughs> the um, the point I was going to make is, with Windows, I think you you do have some ground to stand on. It is hard. It it would be hard to bring the sweeping changes and revolutions that folks would would like myself might have expected would have come in the last 25 years, if only because those changes would be so costly Mm -hmm. to the folks who weren't looking for the changes, but who are Windows users. Right, it's a different type of audience. Yeah, where it's like underneath the covers, I mean, uh, my, 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 like the other side of my experience with the Windows operating system yesterday, I, it was, it was fast. I mean, maybe that was the hardware, but it was snappy in a way that I, I find, you know, OS tend to be a little laggy sometimes. But think of, of, uh, of um, a BlackBerry, if it had survived to this day and UX mm-hmm. was, did, did not exist as a discipline and the iPhone therefore didn't win, mm-hmm. right? We would have a device that it, now, now we have better speech recognition. We'd be able to recognize mm-hmm. your speech. They would have learned that, uh, you know, bigger keys are better. So the device would be bigger because your thumbs could fit on it, right? Uh, but it would also be thicker because now it's got to have like all the different things that engineers thought you should have in it, right? Including maybe a little printer, right? Uh, like it, like there is a huge amount of like if you don't think about the the the, the user experience, right? Mm-hmm. You, you would it you also can't... have a chainsaw too to take the chainsaw. Oh, it'd be down, so, so cute if it had it, a little it, printer and a maybe, little chainsaw. Maybe maybe a place for you to put your the, your car key. I don't know. Like I mean, <laughs> like just so so much, right? 
uh, without regard for the fact that too much, sometimes so much is too much, right? Um, and so engineering by itself is very capable, but the direction that the world would have taken without user experience as more and more possibilities were enabled by engineering might have been a little bit less pretty than it is today. So I, so I think oh, sure. it's- have you used Have you used Microsoft Office? Yes. No, I mean, I, yeah. I, I try not to, in, in part because I just don't have the time. I don't have the time. Yeah. <laughs> it does everything. I know. And sometimes so, that's too much. Sometimes it is too much. And um, we're heading into too much oh, time. Too much time. Okay. Over time. Um, yeah. So what, what do engineers think of UX? We, we think of UX as vital. That's good. You're not just saying that because I'm here. No, I'm not just saying that, really. You, no, okay. you know that. Okay. I completely actually, agree. I'm sorry. It's bad. boring. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah. In the end, after all that, it turns out you agree. Yeah. Um, well, it's been another episode of Door 3 TV Open Hours. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Cora, and her bit part. Thanks, Liz. Bye, everyone. See Thanks, you next time. everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye guys. Hit that like button. Yay. Look at Smash someone who